just my, my pipeline my, that I found online only had four leakage points. So I had to come up with what four examples, but I'm sure there's more than that. And notice at the bottom where it falls, it, it falls into a data swamp. And we'll come back to that, uh, that theme later. Okay, so, so how, do you avoid, um, how do you avoid these sources of data loss? Of course, there are many ways of doing it. You can train people, you can incentivize people. But I think an important uh, theme is automation. Um, if things are handled automatically, then they tend to occur and they tend to occur reliably. You know, that is why my photos are now uh, nicely accessible online and uh, even automatically uh, labeled um, in contrast to how they used to sit in a, in a shoebox. Um, this is a, an artist's impression of a shoebox. It's not actually my shoebox, but that is where I'm sure many photos used to be maintained in the past. And that's because of tools like Flickr and so forth where, that capture the images automatically as they're generated. Um, and how do you uh, enable automation on a large scale? Where again, I think systems like Flickr show the, show the way, cloud computing, software that is hosted by someone else and run for you uh, uh, automatically, routinely, professionally, uh, is how you make automation reliable and affordable. So I'm gonna talk about how we might apply those techniques, uh, automation and outsourcing uh, to problems of data preservation. Just a few words about cloud. We probably all know too much about it. Um, but uh, remind you that we may distinguish between software as a service, software that's accessed over the network uh, and that provides some useful capability to the end user, and platform as a service that provides tools that help you build new software as a service of your own uh, devising. And I'm gonna talk about both of those uh, elements as I now turn to talk about uh, Globus. So we've been developing this Globus Online, it used to be called, we now just call it Globus for about uh, six years. Um, our goal is initially at least was to provide software as a service mechanisms that take out of the user's hands the responsibility for a certain set of actions relating to data management. So uh, with, with our goal was research data lifecycle uh, uh, automation. So here I show uh, behind that in front of that nice Globus logo, uh, a scientific instrument. It could be, I think this is one at the advanced light source at Berkeley, but it could be any instrument of, uh, or uh, simulation system, a compute facility, uh, and uh, you know, a, a person who needs to manage the tr movement of that data. So Globus does that for you, sort of FedEx for data. So how many here have moved data with Globus? Um, okay, and the rest of you, you should be doing it while you're, uh, while you're waiting, it's very easy. Um, so, Globus Transfer Data Movement as a Service, uh, slightly more recently, adding in sharing support. Once data is on a file system, you can control who has access to that data uh, using the web, uh, our web interfaces. Uh, you can also uh, uh, implement um, publication uh, activities. We do hosted data publication services uh, so that uh, you can specify that a particular, uh, you can configure a, your own data collection, saying where the data should go, what metadata should be associated with the collection, what curation steps might be associated with uh, adding data to the collection, and then this cloud-hosted service will uh, manage uh, all of the associated activities. And the resulting data is then uh, discoverable. And this is all uh, like real software as a service, is implemented and accessible via a web browser. So in principle, you don't need to read a manual to use it. You can access any storage pretty much. There's 10,000 Globus endpoints around the world that are active uh, at any one time. And you can use one of your existing campus uh, credentials. So those are nice features. But really what I wanna talk about now is how we provide those capabilities via API so that you can use them as platform services and in, integrate them into existing uh, uh, or new tools of your own that might implement uh, data lifecycle management processes. Oh, I do have a few stats that I need to show you. So uh, what's interesting here? Um, this might be Michigan, I think. They have the most server endpoints on one campus. They've rolled it out very extensively. Um, biggest transfer, a petabyte. 
you can read, read, read the rest of them. Um, you know, I, I did, I'll mention something here. Uh, I said we could access any storage. Well, so far this means uh, any of these storage systems, any uh, Linux, Windows, Mac OS, high performance computing systems, a growing number of cloud and archival storage systems. Google Drive is a recent uh, edition. And a few others are in progress, like uh, iRots, which I think some of you probably are, are probably are using. Okay, so now let me move on to talk about the platform as a service aspects uh, of the system. So, uh, so I've shown you a set of capabilities, described how you can access them using a web browser. Uh, now, for each of those things, we also provide um, a uh, REST API and a Python uh, SDK. So you can write Python code to uh, do things like move data, share data, um, publish data, uh, search for data, and so on and, and so forth. Um, we uh, have APIs both for, so far for transfer, transfer and authorization. I'll talk a bit about each of those. Uh, APIs for publish and search are available but are not widely released yet. Uh, the SDKs are all open source, so you can modify and extend them. You can build your own for other languages if you don't like Python. Um, uh, there's, of course, extensive documentation. Um, and what is I'll try to convince you of and, and give examples of these let you do is to automate you know, large numbers of data lifecycle management processes, much like uh, the tools like Flickr do for uh, your uh, home, home images. A bit about Globus Forth. Uh, so this is one of the, it's in a major API. It underpins everything else that we do. It's uh, an identity and credential management uh, platform, cloud hosted like the rest of Globus, that uh, provides a nice set of capabilities that end up being useful for a lot of different purposes. What they do is let you uh, do things like, uh, I log on with one of a wide variety of different credentials, uh, your in common university credential, um, could be a Google credential, uh, an ORCID ID, uh, many, many others. Uh, link that credential with other credentials if you want, if you need to be able to use ORCID on one site and uh, a different sort of credential somewhere else. Uh, and then uh, it implements you know, OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect protocols so that you can take credentials uh, presented for one purpose, deliver them somewhere else. The receiving party can validate that they are uh, correct, can determine whether or not they are allowed to use them to do certain things uh, and, and so on and so forth. So we use this internally to protect all of our REST API communications and a growing number of other groups are using them for the, for the same purpose. And I'll show here just, uh, this is your log on. Um, you can see Google, ORCID, uh, uh, other credentials. And here's uh, someone who's linking a set of identities. They've got their Tiki at UChicago, ED, EDU, uh, and a few other credentials they've obtained, their ORCID ID, uh, some other ones that they've obtained for other purposes their exceed credential for example so uh, this came out the global source came out really within the last year and we've already seen some fairly substantial adoption the exceed supercomputing network in the US has uh, basically switched over to using this for uh, single sign-on to all of their uh, you know, platforms uh, initially for their supercomputing uh, resources but now also like Jetstream for example which is their cloud system but now also for other things, they've integrated it with Moodle, uh, Jira, um, you know, the regular Exceed logon, their uh, web portal and, and many other things. And because we support you know, OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, this ends up being pretty straightforward to do. Uh, some other ones over here, uh, let's see, what is, there's a uh, K-Base, it's a DOE systems biology project, uh, a couple of um, uh, NIH uh, pro projects. This, I think at this point, several dozen that are using uh, Globus uh, Auth in this way. Uh, and uh, let's see, what these are some recent stats. The top 10 identity providers we've worked with. So John Hopkins can, ends up being one. I didn't know that. Purdue, Michigan, no Notre Dame, but I'm sure you'll get there. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad to see the University of Chicago made it. Um, and then these are the, you know, some of the non-Globus People are starting to develop apps rather than uh, as well as you know just providing access to things like ex, uh, exceed. We've got um, you know things like people people accessing uh, well these are GC, GPCR, GCIRM, 
and K-based are all biology applications exceed and blue waters are both high performance computing systems. Jetstream is a cloud platform and Compute Canada is the uh, Canadian National Supercomputing uh, Network. So uh, Globus Auth, um, Globus Transfer API, I won't say more about it because it simply lets you do the things that the transfer web application does. But these are some of the things that people are starting to, to do with it. So the National Center for Atmospheric Researchers Research Data Archive um, now lets you uh, connect to uh, their portal, search for data, uh, find data, and then download it. So they let you do, uh, do that for a long time. But now the download occurs via high-speed uh, Globus uh, transfer protocols, and they offload all of that transfer management to Globus. So if you look, if you read the fine print, you'll see down here somewhere, you know, if you want to download it, you can do it uh, via um, uh, HTTP, in which case you get, uh, you have to download a, uh, some sort of wget script, which may or may not run reliably and will certainly run slowly. Or you can simply do a Globus transfer uh, download, in which case you get taken to a nice uh, uh, interface uh, like this. Here's another example. This is uh, a group at the Advanced Photon Source at Argonne National Lab. So whenever you pitch up, uh, as thousands of people do each year to run an experiment, uh, this uh, fellow Francesco De Carlo has written a little script. A lot of these things seem almost trivial because uh, when you look at the code, it's so easy to do these things with these APIs. It will query the, uh, their experiment database at the advanced photon source, find the identities of the people who are engaged in the experiment, we will then use our APIs to create a shared endpoint on a big storage system that we operate, uh, set access permissions to that endpoint uh, to the people who are participating in the experiment, and then transfer the data uh, as it is collected to that location. And then anyone in the experiment worldwide can access uh, the data without any further intervention uh, by them. At some time in the future, I think they keep it around for a few weeks, they then delete the data, and, uh, and hopefully uh, they are on their way. Um, this is part of a series of activities we're engaged in where we're automating more and more of the data movement through uh, this very complex apparatus using these globus mechanisms. Uh, the same thing is happening at the advanced light source at Berkeley, um, where they are using the, uh, there's a system called Spot Suite and it uses globus for authentication and data movement uh, in the same uh, manner. <laughs> And here's a rather different example, the uh, materials data facility, which is a, a data public data, which is a couple of things. First of all, a data repository for people who want to publish materials data. And secondly, a system um, that index harvests and indexes metadata from other materials and data repositories. And uh, here where uh, well, they make use of our APIs for data publication, data search, access control, data transfer. The data search isn't widely released yet, but uh, several groups are working with it. So this shows, uh, you know, the, I'll say more about this in a minute, but this you know, shows a, a typical sort of uh, interface to uh, the several thousands of uh, different data sets. I think we have a million records altogether that have been collected from various sources relating to, to, to materials. Okay, so that's, uh, said a few words about the web interface, a few words about our APIs and how they might be used for, uh, to automate various uh, parts of this leaky uh, pipeline. I now wanted to say just a bit about where we're going and perhaps these are areas where we might be able to collaborate with some people uh, in, this, uh, in this room. So, um, you know, our goal is, uh, continues to be to uh, reduce barriers to data collection, sharing, uh, storage, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that way, I think our, uh, our goals are quite complementary to uh, the work that's been done by the Open Science Framework, for example. We're focused on the, the plumbing aspects of how do you determine who, how, who someone is, how do you move data from one place to another, how do you manage access. We're not concerned with where the data is stored. That's uh, someone else's concern as far as we're concerned. Um, but uh, we are concerned with addressing more aspects of the data sharing and discovery process. So at this point, we have some 10,000 uh, endpoints 
uh, of course, not all accessible to everyone. Each person typically has access to a fairly small number of these endpoints that are globus accessible. But many people have access to many endpoints that contain large, amount of, large amounts of data. So we want to start making it easier uh, and easier for people to manage the data that is located in these endpoints. Uh, data that may today sit in what you might call a data swamp because it's mostly unindexed, um, largely unknown, uh, and uh, you know, often not uh, well understood. So uh, we're pushing in a few directions here. So now I'm gonna show you some things that are more a work in progress. Some of these are mock-ups, not actual uh, uh, things that you can use today. So first of all, we want to make it, uh, when you turn up to a Globus endpoint, you won't just see a simple uh, file browser and a, uh, a transfer button, as you see at the moment. You'll see a much richer set of uh, interfaces to your data. You'll see uh, uh, you know, faceted search capabilities, um, the ability to add uh, metadata, the ability to perhaps uh, invoke computation on the data uh, to the extent uh, that we have that ability on a particular endpoint, uh, and uh, you know more uh, data type specific uh, information uh, relating to, to the data that you've got stored there. So here, those in the front row might see that this is uh, you know, data about a uh, traumatic brain injury uh, experiment. So you'll see there's PDFs and images and metadata and so forth associated uh, with it, and a set of actions here that uh, you might want to perform on that data. Yeah? Yeah, we have a, um, as in, uh, we're very eclectic, so uh, it's highly extensible, right? So uh, What's sitting under the covers here is the endpoint has got your data as before, and it's got a set of JSON files that you may or may not have put there, depending on whether you have the tools to extract metadata and or, or collect metadata. Uh, and those JSON files can be in whatever format you want. And now our interface is smart enough to be able to deal with a variety of different uh, representations. So uh, you know, our goal is not, as always, is we don't want to own anyone's data. We just want to be able to get access to it and help you to, to interpret it. Can I ask a very quick question? Yeah. If my interface for Globus doesn't look like that yet, does that mean I'm on like an older version? Uh, yeah, so I did say um, uh, maybe it's like one of these people selling something online. I spoke very fast. I said, this, <laughs> some of the slides in this part of the talk, uh, our vision for the future, um, reflect things that we have sitting in our lab but not, uh, not released. Yeah, so we don't at the moment, your interface will look like a traditional file browser uh, with a transfer button, right? And a few other options like share. Um, this is something that we haven't got uh, widely available yet, but we're looking for it, people to work on with. with. Even as users adopt it. Sorry? Even as users adopt it. Yeah. <laughs> so what's happened here? Uh, oh, I see. Now we're, um, I see. Now we're moving into a, a slide that's a build. So, so search, um, a few more words about what, where we're going with search. You know, we want to uh, imagine ourselves collecting, allowing search over data that's on storage that we have access to and also other repositories. So we're already doing that in the materials context. Uh, and we do that because these JSON globs of metadata that we work with can either, we can either harvest them themselves or people can provide them to us via one of our uh, APIs. Uh, importantly, for some of our applications where all our search capabilities are access control aware, so you can, you can have data that's um, private, but metadata that's public, if you want people to be able to find your data, but then they have to ask access for it. Or perhaps some metadata is private and some is public, depending on whether it's uh, sensitive uh, or, or not. And that ends up being important for quite a few of the groups that we're working with. Um, we can deal with a wide variety of uh, schemas. As I mentioned, we're basically schema agnostic. Um, and uh, you know, we've got a wide variety of search. So plain text search, facets, uh, mechanisms for related search. Where we want to go is adding ratings, reviews, comments. We're working with some groups that want to be able to you know, automatically discover scientific articles that are related to data they have and uh, determining whether data sets are, um, are uh, related to each other. 
that's not something we want to do in the general sense, but we want to provide the mechanism. So if someone has a tool for inferring relationships, they can easily uh, describe them to us and then we can make use of that uh, information. So this is a, well, depending on your perspective, it's either a nice or an ugly looking API. Um, if it does what you want, all well and good, but if not, you know, our, our search again is a platform as a service offering. So you can, it has a set of REST APIs. You can build your own um, uh, tools that sit on top of it. You know, you can create custom indices. Uh, you can publish metadata to different places. Uh, you can implement your own uh, web interfaces or mobile applications or, or just uh, uh, thick, uh, thick client applications if you want. And uh, we're starting to see a number of groups uh, doing that. Now, I, I referred to the data swamp at the beginning of the, the talk. So uh, I, I thought I'd mention, put up a slide that shows some work that some students of, of mine are, are, are doing, uh, along with an, another faculty, Aaron Elmore. So uh, as I said, most data ends, this is my view, and maybe the rest of you have much better experiences, but you know, a typical experience for me is I go to visit the National Cancer Institute and the fellow who runs their computer says, I've got three petabytes of storage and I have no idea what's on it. And, and I think that some of it's useful, but I don't know which bits. Um, this is uh, a histogram of file types in a uh, something called the National uh, was it National Carbon Dioxide Information uh, Center Analysis Center, and so you'll you can't read the fine print, but they have a lot of I can't even read it here, but a lot of uh, net CDF files. I think a lot of uh, text files and very inconsistent and limited documentation. So we're starting to, we've got a project with these students where we're working on methods for automatically inferring the type of data, uh, trying to work out which fields are significant for indexing, um, you know, working out which you can tag with uh, things like atmospheric science or oceanography. Um, we'll see where that goes, but the experience from this is feeding back into uh, the work we're doing with the, uh, the Globus um, search. Well, one, one idea that we, sort of interested in pursuing is working out where you could engage users in this process. So you could run a, you know, perhaps some analysis process, discover these hundred files are very similar, and then ask someone, say, well, what, what's the most unique characteristics of these uh, files that we found? And perhaps that would then provide metadata that could be applied to all of the similar files that, that you've discovered. Okay, so that was all I had to say. Um, we benefit from, uh, many sponsors. Um, and uh, if you want more information, this is uh, the Globus service, this is uh, the research group, uh, and this is my email address. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Lynn. So those are good questions. Thank you. So um, the first of all, you know, the, we're not operating a data repository. The data data sits in many places, thousands of places. Uh, one group that we work with who is building a data repository is the Materials Data Facility, uh, and there they are uh, they're using storage at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications for it to store the materials data that people are contributing. Uh, the the data that we harvest from various locations, or that is uploaded into our uh, metadata, metadata collection, is indexed uh, mostly using Elasticsearch at the moment, which uh, so far seems to be working pretty well. Although, and then, yeah. Uh, like in terms of keywords, keywords yeah. in there, is this audience like generated by the user or whether the public data versus public keywords? Or is there like yeah, so, so far it's uh, so far it's all. Um, uh, coming from this JSON data that we're up, up, 
which has been user or automatically generated. Uh, you know, going forward, we're interested in also automatically extracting other features of data, perhaps type in, using type inference or computing properties of the data. But that's sort of orthogonal to the indexing component that we're doing. Um, let's see, what else did you? Oh, yeah, so we're not, we haven't done any work particularly with publications. Yeah. Uh, so some of the material. So the materials data facility is using our publication pipeline to record, to, to archive data, assign DOIs, and then those DI, DOIs, DOIs are being given to people to put into publications. So that's a, a different uh, activity. Yeah. Sean, thank you. Mm -hmm.